Hello and welcome to this presentation and demonstration on Oracle Machine Learning, uh, a collection of over 30 machine learning algorithms that are embedded deep inside the Oracle database. And so in this presentation, I'm going to get, give an overview of those features and functions. And I'm also going to talk about this exciting journey that I think many Oracle data professionals can now go on to evolve their skills, add machine learning skills to their vast set of Oracle skills and become Oracle data scientists. So hi, my name is Charlie Berger. I'm the Senior Director of Product Management for Machine Learning, AI, and Cognitive Analytics. And in this next hour and a few minutes uh, presentation and demonstration, I will try to cover all of what I uh, said. But the punchline uh, of what I'm about to talk about begins a long time ago when uh, Oracle acquired the technical assets of a company called Thinking Machines Corporation. And at the time, way back in the late 90s, we had a bunch of algorithms that ran in our own multi um, processor, parallel processing connection machines. They ran on Unix machines, and they were um, powerful in finding patterns in vast amounts of data. But the problem that we saw even way back then was as the volumes of data get larger, and they're just going to keep on getting larger, right? So as the volumes of data get larger and larger, do you not reach some sort of point where it makes no sense to move the algorithm, move the data out to some special algorithm platform, you know, some some sort of analytical compute platform like Python or R or SAS or SPSS or you know, you name it, your favorite, you know, machine learning or analytical or statistical platform. Why do you need to move the data to that platform to do the computations if instead you can move the algorithms to the data management platform? So that's what we've done for the last 20 years. We've moved the algorithms, not the data, and we've taught the you know, many decades old converged now Oracle database. We've taught that database how to do many things, deal with uh, JSON documents, deal with spatial uh, technologies, graph technologies, uh, in-memory calculations, um, many, many, many things. Uh, we now call it the converged database. And one of those many and yet very, very powerful things is machine learning, uh, what we call the Oracle machine learning uh, capability of the database. And the other part of this that I hope you find very interesting is if you have an Oracle database, Enterprise Edition, Autonomous, or SE2, uh, any of those databases, the Oracle machine learning algorithms are all embedded and they are all included at no additional charge. So you have these algorithms and it just sort of opens up all these new possibilities for you. So I'm going to try and go through that now in the next uh, um, roughly about an hour and I hope you find this uh, helpful. Oracle always requires a safe harbor statement that just says that anything that I may talk about that is sort of futures, as I record this on May 1st, 2020, uh, and there are some things about futures here, uh, in the very near future that is, but there is no, it's intended for a general uh, product direction. It's not intended for any kind of commitment or delivery uh, by any timeline or anything like that. So we always require to put up this safe harbor statement. And the goal of this presentation is to share an attainable, logical evolutionary path for Oracle data professionals to add machine learning to their valuable Oracle data skills to extract more information, uh, discover new insights, and ultimately oftentimes to make predictions. So I'll give you an overview of the product, the functionality, and then talk about this journey I think we can all go on together. So at last Oracle Open World, Larry Ellison um, was speaking as he usually does, and I sat up in front and I actually took this picture. And uh, there was Larry talking about what we're now calling an Oracle the Converged Database. So the Converged Database has many features that we've been adding to the database over time. Multi-tenant, in-memory analytics, uh, hyperscale, JSON, um, blockchain, and so on. And the one that I like the most that he's talking about as well is the machine learning. And he's also talking about some of the new capabilities called the AutoML, which does even more automation than we have that we currently do today. We're, we're automating even more, and I'll talk about that later on. So these are all features that are now in this converged database. So it's not just a place to store and manage your data anymore. The Oracle database, this is converged database. They can do many, many things. It's like a Swiss army knife, if you will. But one of the most powerful things I think that it has these days, at least from my point of view, is the ability to analyze data, find patterns, and make predictions. So really harvest more information out of your data and uh, act proactively on, uh, you know, compete on analytics, as, you, as they say. Oracle also came out with a new mission statement, and uh, the mission now is to help people see data in new ways, discover insights, and unlock endless possibilities. Now, this reminds me of that kid in that Bruce Willis film, The Sixth Sense, who said he could see dead people. And for me, it, it seems a little bit analogous to that, but for me, 
I see machine learning, and I hope you do too. Uh, I think when you see this and you think about the data this way, you say, well, why do I have only a rear view mirror on my data? Why am I only looking at the past and maybe the present? I should be able to analyze that data, look at patterns, look at predictions, and uh, look at patterns and, and correlations and such, and be able to make intelligent predictions using the past as a predictor of the future. So that's what we'll cover uh, going forward. Now, I just have a few slides of the sort of general trend that we see going on in the industry. And we see uh, these are these are areas that other people at Oracle can probably talk about with much greater uh, uh, expertise than I can. But I just want to kind of bring them up because they are important. And so today, traditionally, DBAs, operational DBAs, that is, and I know I am talking about a whole range of Oracle professionals from DBAs to database developers to BI analysts to data analysts and, and ultimately to managers and end users, the whole spectrum of people. Um, so, But the operational DBAs, the guys in the back that are keeping the whole system up and running, they spend a lot of time on maintenance and on security and reliability. And um, this is important work that has to be done, but Oracle has been spending a lot of time and wherever possible, trying to automate these steps. And where it has become the most automated uh, is what we call the Oracle Autonomous Database. So this is up on the cloud. We also have many, many of these features also in the Oracle databases that are on premises. But in the Autonomous Database, we've taken it to the extreme. So in the Autonomous Database, the database is now self-driving, self-securing, self-repairing. And even people like me, I can just go up to the Oracle uh, Always Free Tier and log in, take out an account, and within two or three minutes, fire up a whole Oracle database, be admin of it, and then go down the path towards the Oracle machine learning, and I can be building predictive models in probably, you know, from zero to uh, predictive models in like, you know, less than five minutes. So there's a lot more automation, and with this automation uh, come many, I think, new opportunities. And one of them is that through all this automation, both on-premises and in the cloud, and just, you know, in the coming years, ahead, we hope to see um, more and more automation of many, many sort of routine tasks. And now those people that really know the data, they know the, the domain. If you're, if you're in the shoe business, they know the shoe business and they know the data about the shoe business. If you're in the financial business, they know that business as well and they know the data about the financial business. So these very skilled and capable data professionals who uh, uh, know the Oracle technologies are now able to um, hopefully move on and, and do, add some additional you know, skills and do some additional things uh, that go beyond uh, what they've traditionally been doing. And there are many things that people talk about um, you know, as new opportunities, new open doors, uh, more of a data engineer doing more data wrangling, dealing more with security, uh, application tuning, and the one in the upper right that I like uh, is machine learning, solving data-driven problems, discovering insights, and making predictions. So also at Oracle Open World, but two Oracle Open Worlds ago, Larry Ellison was talking about why Oracle was going was gonna to succeed in this area of adding machine learning to its already um, very capable converged database. And he, he made the, the comment that is, you know, in so many ways so obvious, like the banker that was asked, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. And in this case, why would, you, why would machine learning at Oracle, you know, be successful? Well, that's where the data is. Now, True. If you don't have your data in an Oracle database, I'm not going to try and convince you that you need to use Oracle machine learning to do all of your machine learning because there are many other competitive offerings and open source offerings that do great and wonderful machine learning. Uh, but they start with this premise that I have to move the data out of the Oracle database or out of the, any other vendor's database or out of Hadoop or whatever. And the point that I'm trying to make is if you do have some or most or all of your data in an Oracle ecosystem, then why would you ever need to move it in order to do these calculations? The algorithms are part of the database. So just leave the data right where it is and do the processing you know, in place. Let the data management platform also do the math. Now I want to back this up just a little bit because some people may be a little bit new to machine learning and they may say, well, what is machine learning? I'd like to know where and how I can you know, apply this new thing, but what, but what is it exactly? And so I like this definition. Um, al what is machine learning? It's simply algorithms that automatically sift through large amounts of data to discover hidden patterns, um, new insights, and make predictions. And there are number of, a number of different sort of functions or, or ca categories of machine learning that people typically do. I know some people call it, you know, oh, it's algorithm, it's it's analytics, and and or maybe it's advanced analytics. But those are very broad definitions, and there are. Um, 
there are many different kinds of um, algorithms and techniques that are out there. So I want to kind of talk about those in a little bit greater detail. On the top, the top three are what we would call supervised learning. These are the cases where you have um, historical data that is also labeled. Like I know people who bought a car and people who didn't buy a car. They're flagged as like car buyer, not car buyer, people that default on a loan, people that don't default on a loan. People that are very high value customers, maybe medium value customers and low value customers, you know, in terms of how much they, they spend. Um, and those are all, that's all supervised learning because you have labeled historical data and you're trying to build predictive models to predict which class uh, or category you belong, you're a member of. And if that value that you're trying to predict is a continuous numerical value, we call that regression. So these are all the top three are examples of what we'd call supervised learning. And frankly, that's what most people do most of the time in machine learning. The bottom three are what we call supervised learning. And they are trying to let the algorithm sort of on its own go find patterns and relationships in the data. So we're trying to segment the population and discover new pockets of uh, the population. That would be called um, clustering. To find anomalous or fraudulent events, that would be called anomaly detection. To do market basket analysis, try to find, well, when you buy um, ketchup and mustard and hamburgers, well, you probably also want to buy some hamburger buns, and maybe some beer. So these are things that you typically see to go, go together and on the shelves or at a recommendation engine, you may want to place the items together or recommend something. So there's different categories of machine learning algorithms uh, that are out there and there are different use cases. Now I borrowed this from a search on the internet and wherever I do something like that, I try to reference where I got it from. And this was a nice summary of what this author was claiming were uh, many popular use cases for machine learning. And I think it's all valid and true. What I've done is highlight in red, uh, or underlined in red, those ones that I've personally seen, been involved with, helped customers apply Oracle machine learning to those use cases. So I, do, I don't want to say that every one of these things, like clinical trials, um, typically that's done with specialized, you know, using SAS or, or, or R or something. There's special protocols that are required in some of these things. Large stream, large scale click stream analysis, eh, not exactly. It's not something I would claim was right in Oracle Machine Learning's wheelhouse. But the other ones that I've highlighted are ones that I think are good examples. So if you're in any one of these industries, hopefully some of these examples uh, sort of resonate with you. And there are many, many other examples and use cases that are possible out there. These are just ones, you know, that you're just basically solving data-driven problems. And these are ones that I've had some experience with or, or you know, seen people use Oracle Machine Learning for. So now the next point that I want to make is how we go about doing this. Um, and if you're familiar with math at all, then you might have already recognized the equation I have on the far right. That is called Bayes' theorem. Now, Bayes, Lord Bayes, was a uh, mathematician way back, and I think it was the 1700s, and he had um, come up with this equation, basically, this computation that said, I can do counting of the past and build basically a conditional probability model. So how many times the person defaulted on a loan and they were a male versus they were a female? How many times they defaulted on a loan and they were a house owner or an apartment renter? Uh, were they a dog owner or a dog or a cat owner? Um, if they, uh, if I have a numerical value like age, maybe what I do is I bin the data into, you know, zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and so on. And I count the number of times that you are a house owner, a male, and in age bin four, things like that, and you default on a loan. So the simplicity of this makes it something that's very easily moved into the Oracle database because the database is very, very good at counting, right? And if you have a, a, a lot of parallelism in your database and a lot of CPUs, um, we leverage the full parallel, parallel processing capability of that database when we build our naive Bayes models. And um, when you take that logic, um, you, you can see how we just, you know, remove the requirement to move the data somewhere else to the computation computations. We're leveraging all the strengths and power of the database. And if you start out with that as a, as a starting algorithm, then you can think that, well, maybe over time, I can keep on adding more and more algorithms to the database, teach the database how to do more and more math, which is what our developers have done. And now in 2020, 
we have over 30 algorithms uh, for doing classification, regression, and so on. Now, the very first two algorithms were the naive Bayes, because it's based on counting, and the other one, if you haven't guessed it yet, was the a priori market basket analysis uh, algorithm, because that's just counting you know, the number of times you have ketchup and mustard and also hamburgers in your basket and so on. You know, the old beer and diaper stories, if you, if you know that one. Um, so we also did not limit these algorithms to speaking only SQL language. They're, they are at the core SQL functions when we build the model, when we apply the models. We use PL SQL to go through a whole methodology to bin the data and we do the calculations, do recursive partitioning in the case of a decision tree and so on and neural networks and all of, all of this, once the model is, is built and it's codified as a model object, which is a, an assembly of different objects inside the database, I can apply that model as a, as a SQL function to score you know, on the fly. And if you have exadata, it even scores down to the storage tier. So it's extremely powerful in its, in its uh, capabilities because we've merged the algorithms into the database as peer functionality to all the rest of the functionality database. So if you have Oracle text, we can ingest textual data, unstructured data. If you have aggregations, we can ingest um, transactional data into the algorithms and so on. And moreover, we, we didn't stop there. We said, well, not everyone happens to speak SQL, although it's a very powerful language and that's what many data professionals use. Data scientists over the years have spoken different languages. Uh, for some period of time, they've spoken R. It's been a very popular language, still is. And more recently, Python has sort of come up and overtaken R, and we support and have supported R for some number of years, and we are now also supporting Python in the very few next coming weeks as I, as I record this in, uh, you know, the first of May. So hopefully by the time you're listening to this, it's already out there. Uh, but so we have a whole range of over 30 algorithms. They are exposed to notebooks, GUIs, SQL, their native core native function SQL, R, and Python. And when you move algorithms to where the data resides, you kind of change the database, right? You, you transform it, you extend it. And, and now I, I hesitate a little bit because I've, I've lived through the second AI winter back in the uh, 80s, but is not the database becoming, or could it not be thought of a little bit more as an AI kind of database or a thinking database? Um, it really sort of changes everything because my database doesn't have to just look at the past. It can look at the past, the present, and, and actually make some predictions about the future. So it's very exciting times if you are an Oracle data professional. Now you can harness and leverage these free 30-something uh, algorithms. And so overall, what we're talking about is called Oracle Machine Learning. It extends the database and enables users to build AI applications and analytical dashboards. Um, the OML delivers powerful in-database machine learning algorithms, automated machine learning function functionality, and also integration with open source Python, which is coming very, very soon, and R. So on the right, you see the native core OML for SQL. That's the API that I'll show in more detail. OML for R, that's when we wrap and integrate um, the algorithms and expose them to R. And you can use R to push down uh, R functions to equivalent SQL functions. Uh, similarly, uh, if you use Python, we'll do the same thing. The notebooks up on the upper right, the OML notebooks, they come with the autonomous databases. So in the autonomous world, we're going to everything sort of packaged, um, ease of use, thin browsers, and that's where we're going to notebooks and also a new user interface called auto ML user interface. On premises or in databases as a cloud service, you can use the SQL developer uh, extension called Oracle Data Miner. Okay, and I'll show that as well. And then we also have OML for Spark, which is a library of algorithms that use an R-based API for on big data and Spark. And then we have something else that's coming out. It's been used internally for other Oracle applications, and we're making this available to the general public in the coming weeks, and it's called OML Services. So I'll cover that briefly going forward. At this point, I like to kind of point out that what's, what's key about machine learning and, and, and where people sometimes run into problems. And Fern Halper uh, from TDWI asked this question. I think it's the right question to ask. How long does it take to put a defined model into operational use. And the key word here is defined model. It means I've already built the model in Python or TensorFlow or, or, or R or, or MATLAB or SAS. And I have a very good model the data scientist has built. And they now come to IT and say, I'd like to productionize this. I'd like to deploy this somehow. And so based on the survey of respondents, you know, it's a long time. And if you take from three months to, I guess, infinity, that's something like I think 65% of the population, 65% uh, of these of these use cases are you know, three to three to three months to never, perhaps, and 
it's a long time. And that's why I think you see a lot of excitement about machine learning, but not nearly as much operationalization of it, except for the really powerhouses that really spend a, you know, a, a large amount of effort doing this because it's, it's hard work to do it and do it well. And so I say now with my editorial comment, this is Fern's slide, this is now my editorial comment. They must be using products like that, right? They must be because that's requiring you to take the data out and move it somewhere else to perform the analysis. And then once you have a model built, how do you get that model into production? It's a whole nother phase and that translating of that model into some code that can be implemented inside the database and deployed or operationalized is where uh, most people stumble. So if you had done this in Oracle, it would be immediate, right? I build a model and I score the model, it's immediate. So that's, that's my sort of editorial comment on Fern's excellent study. I also like this other um, study. It's um, done um, by, I think, uh, AdventureBeat, it's where it's published. And it says, why do 87% of data science projects never make it into production? And it goes on to talk about, you know, you're asking an engineer to write, uh, rewrite a data science model created by a data scientist. How's that usually work? Well, it doesn't. And it goes on to talk about in greater details, you can read the, you know, the link and go read the rest of the um, uh, article there. But it, I think it's very revealing that, you know, all this data science, all this machine learning, but only 13% actually make it into production. That's, that's, that's scary. And if you remember the old Netflix story where Netflix offered a million dollars to whatever data science team could beat their predictive models they were currently using, they did give an award to a team that had almost reached their goal of, of I think it was 10% more accurate. But what they never went back and, and followed up on, well, and a, a reporter finally went back and studied it, and they said, well, they, they gave away the million dollars for the better analytical methodology, but Netflix never implemented and it never implemented it because of this sort of logic. It was this very convoluted analytical methodology that that was just so complicated um, to 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 you know operationalize that they just never implemented it. And it, had they done that inside the database using the in database SQL functions, it would have been much more straightforward. So now let's let's get into the uh, Oracle machine learning functionality and the supported languages and and the algorithms and such. So. We are, we're over 30 algorithms inside the database. We have classification models. I think there's one, two, three, seven or eight or nine. There's there's two more that are coming. XG Boost is coming in the 20C release, as is uh, in, in anomaly detection. There's another one called uh, MSET SPRT. So it's a process monitoring. So it, with every new release of the database, we add one, two or three major new algorithms typically. So now after doing this for a while, we're up to quite an extensive library of, of machine learning power tools that really just pour through your data using all the parallelism and scalability of the database. And I would like to say that these are sort of not your standard algorithms like you would use in R or Python. They are like those algorithms like R in Python and that they are logistic regression, they are support vector machines, they are random forest neural net algorithms, but they're in database implementations of them. We don't move the data out to an R data frame or, a, or out to Pandas or something to do the math. We teach the database how to do math and you can call it from a SQL function, from an R, or for a, uh, from a Python API. But under the hood, all of the processing is leveraging all the scalability and the parallelism of the Oracle database. And with that comes a lot of other uh, niceties, if you will. There are other peer functionality uh, features that are in the database that we also sit alongside of and can leverage. Um, if you have a predictive model for who you're going to vote, for, who's going to win the of the election and you have the let's say democratic versus the republican uh, candidate in the united states you could say well you know alabama is different than uh, alaska i would like to partition my model by state maybe i want to say partition it by state and gender and now i have a hundred different models just by a simple build a model partitioned by state and gender very very powerful feature just using the partition by clause if i have unstructured data and i always joke that if marital status is not single, married, divorced, whatever, it is instead uh, an email or it's a, a prenuptial agreement or it's a series of tweets or whatever, I can take all that unstructured data and Oracle text can parse through all that and tokenize that data and pe peel out all the words, throw away the stop words, give us a vector of words and counts of those terms. And we use something called TFIDF, term frequency inverse document frequency to essentially take what they call a bag of words approach, but to bring in a vector of the amount of times 
uh, each person would say certain words compared to how often the population average says those certain words. And all that unstructured data now is, is ingested and pulled into my predictive model along with age, income, and all my other numerical values. Um, I have uh, the ability to handle transactional data. So uh, later on, I think I mentioned the UK national healthcare system, which is a very successful public reference, having identified over a billion dollars of, of potential fraud. But if you think about their use case, medic medications would typically be one of the things you'd be looking at for either fraud or, or better, healthier outcomes. You want to know, well, what medications is the customer on, uh, is the patient on? And if you think of the way you would do that in traditional Python or R or SAS, you would have to allocate a column for each different possible medication, and you'd have a lot of blanks. Well, that's not the way people store the data. They store that data in the database as transactional data. So you'd have Charlie Berger, and then you'd have drug A, one, two, three of them, drug B, four, five, six, and all the different drugs that I'm on would be a, a, a nested table of transactions. And what we do is we, we use the aggregation features of the database to count those all up and bring that in as a vector that we call a nested column uh, alongside of age, income, blood type, you know, blood pressure, everything else that I have in order to make my prediction. So what I'm, what I'm trying to share is that the algorithms are not just your standard algorithms. They are what you can imagine an algorithm implemented inside the database would be um, it's also a first-class object, so if I want to build it and have my privs to build it and edit it, but give it to someone else with only privs to apply it and use it, I can do that. I can have auditing of, of who touched that model when. Uh, I can do many, many things. So it really is um, very powerful analytical clay with which you can work. We also integrate with Python and R, as I've said. The R is today. The Python is in the coming weeks. But you can now use those languages to drive these same in-database algorithms and you can also do callouts using what we call embedded R, embedded execution, where I can let the database, Oracle Machine Learning, make a callout to a special R or Python package to do whatever R or Python package I want to use, you know, does. But then I can bring the results back in, or I can take that model that I've built and use it to sort of as a function score things in the database. So we also have some new features for model deployment and monitoring, monitoring that are coming out um, in these REST uh, Oracle Machine Learning services. But, uh, you know, my point is there's a lot of functionality here that you can use today at no additional charge to solve many, many data-driven problems. There are also a number of statistical functions. Now, these have been most of the stats functions we added in release 10G R2 during the sort of heyday of the Human Genome Project. And a lot of people didn't know about these features that we added because they were free, and you had to go to the SQL reference guide and read all the way down to the S's to see these things. But, you know, t-test, f-test, one-way ANOVAs, uh, correlation um, uh, analysis with Pe Spearman's or, or Pearson's or Kendall's Tau, all cross tabs, chi-square, all of these things, along with the analytical SQL functions for lead and lag functions, SQL pattern matching, all of these techniques are just part of this whole analytical toolbox that's deeply embedded inside your Oracle database. And these two are callable via, you know, the native SQL functions, also the R integration um, and the Oracle Data Miner GUI and notebooks and uh, and so on. So today, Oracle's goal is more than it's been in the past. It's not only to manage, secure, you know, safely retrieve data out of a data repository. Now it's to, while we're doing all that, we also want to analyze your data. So now, regardless of whether or not you're using the R uh, API or the coming um, Python APIs or the Oracle drag and drop, uh, Oracle Data Miner user interface, part of SQL Developer, or the new notebooks that come with um, the autonomous database, you have a number of different sort of touch points. Each member of your data science team can use the language or user interface of their choice, and they can all work together. And the data and the algorithms will be operating you know, on the data inside the Oracle database. We also have um, algorithms that run outside the database with the Oracle Machine Learning for Spark that I mentioned, and you can do a lot with that, and that's an R-based API. Something else I think I'd like you to also consider is I think lots of times the data that's out here may be data that needs to be boiled down. I call this boil down the data lake. And I don't really care about sensor and temperature data. You know, is it 72 degrees in this room for the last, you know, three weeks? I just want to know if on my refrigeration truck did the temperature ever drop, you know, or get above 32 degrees, say up to 40 degrees for more than an hour because then I'm concerned about the quality of my food that's frozen in that truck. So I may use big data SQL to an Oracle Cloud SQL 
to do counts and get totals over time and number measure the number of events that have happened, the number of dropped calls, join that with the rest of the data that I need about the age of the customer, or the age of the device, and you know the plan they're on and so on to make an intelligent prediction. So I think all these things sort of come together, but you don't, my, the other point is you don't have to move all this data to yet another platform to do the math and then bring the results back. You're leveraging your data management platform to do all this math. And under the hood, when we do this, it's really as simple as this, right? It's begin DBMS data mining create model. Uh, the name of the model is going to be a buy insurance model. We're going to predict whether or not you're likely to buy insurance to go on a trip or go on a cruise or whatever you're going to do. Um, and the mining function is going to be a classification function rather than regression or anomaly detection and so on. The data table name or data, it could be a view, table or view is customer insurance lifetime value. The unique identifier is customer ID. The target column, because we're doing supervised learning, we say we want to know who's buying insurance and who's not buying insurance, or maybe buying a car, buying a Tesla, defaulting on a loan, whatever that target field is. And the settings table, you can drive that either with a settings table or you can do it sort of on the fly with another way of doing this called create model two. But we, we, we set this up, we run that, it runs as a PL SQL procedure to build the model. It's doing automatic data preparation, so handling missing values automatically, doing binning, uh, transforming variables as they need to be transformed to go into, say, you know, take the log of a variable or normalize a variable and so on. It's doing all that as a PL SQL procedure. Once the model is run, you can apply the model immediately using even dual. So I have some new um, uh, values for age or income or whatever I can just use from dual and I can get a prediction and the prediction is like immediate. So I'm not going to cut over to the live demo until a little bit later on, but that's all it is. And if I'm doing a different type of function, say an attribute importance, then it's an attribute importance model. So all, everything else is the same. I just change the mining function that I'm doing and I change and I run the diff slightly different syntax and I get my results. Attribute importance value, bank funds, monthly, uh, money monthly overdrawn, and so on, 0 0.21, 0 0.14, and so on. But if you say, well, Charlie, I actually don't speak SQL that well. I'm more of an R or, or, or a Python type of person. Well, if I speak R, I just use the R language syntax to drive those same functions. So it's just ORE, ODM, AI, attribute importance, the target field being buy insurance. That's the table I'm using. So I just use the R language to call those same functions and I get the same 0.2161.14 I get the same results I'm just speaking a different language and that's how we integrate um, R and Python to let the speakers of those languages those data scientists speak their native tongue and drive these same algorithms they can also make callouts and do whatever they want with the data in R and Python um, but you do have to move the data in those cases you can also use the embedded R to make callouts do something special and that's where we see a lot of people you know saying well I'm going to use I can get 90, 95% of my work done using the in database functions, but there's a few specialty things I need to do, like a weight of evidence calculation or whatever, and I can do those, or I have a special equation that I run my business on, and I can do that R equation as a callout or a, or a Python callout and so on. So as I said, if you're using Python, and this is coming soon, and as I record this May 1st, it's in the upcoming very small number of weeks, uh, this will be also available. So I can use Python language and syntax, and I get the exact same results, 0.2161 and so on. So I'm going to start off with a little bit more drill down on some of the features and functions now, and then we'll get into phase two where we talk about this journey that we're all going to go on. But um, here is Oracle Data Miner user interface, and it's a drag and drop user interface. It's part of SQL Developer, and it's very easy, easy to use um, methodology. And what I'm going to do is go over here to this live um, sort of recorded demo that I did before, just so I can kind of have you see what's going on while I talk. But it's part of SQL Developer. I just go to SQL Developer and I launch it. And once I launch, once I launch SQL Developer, I have uh, the ability to call the SQL functions as a script. I can call the workflow, which is just a nice user interface on top of that. I can view the data, which is in the database, right? And there's the SQL of that data in the database. I can look at uh, the data visually using an explore node and all the processing for the the standard deviations, the min, the max, all the binning, all of that is processing inside the database. And if I want to look at a few different variables grouped by some other field like uh, the value, um, all of that is, is just performed inside the database. Here I'm using what's called a column filter node to do an attribute importance to figure out for who's going to buy insurance, what are the key variables? And there they all are. And I also have counted the number of nulls and constants and missing values. I may decide to just leave that result in the database and come back and look at that in, say, Apex or, Apple, or, or OAC. 
Now I'm building models, and I'm building a generalized linear model, an SVM, and so on. And each model has different settings, like ridge regression on, which solvers I'm going to use, and uh, stratified sampling. We'll do the automatic 60-40 split for you as the, in the course of uh, this. I can do lift charts and cumulative gain charts. I can do a different performance metrics, all the different sort of model evaluation techniques you would expect. Once I'm done, I can review any model like this ex uh, example decision tree and see, you know, what are the rules if bank funds and checking them out and so on. Then I have my rule and my prediction and my probability of that prediction. Now I can take that other data set, the apply data set, and feed it into that model and make predictions. And for each prediction, I also have something called a prediction detail, which explains the reasons why that algorithm is making that prediction. So there's a lot of functionality there, and it's, it's very um, easy to use and, and straightforward. If I happen to be using R, if R is my native tongue, I can do the same sort of thing, but I'm using the R language. So the power of this really comes in the ability to do this R language to SQL pushdown. So this is transparency layer that pushes down to equivalent SQL functions for parallelized in database processing. I have direct, ac direct access to the data. Uh, the R Oracle package for OCI connectivity is, is maintained and you know developed and maintained by Oracle. And I also have this beautiful capability to do embedded R callouts to any of the open source CRAN R packages that are out there. And in that case, the database does all the processing, serves up the data, calls over to R, has R do its thing, and then brings the results back. Now, if you're going to do that for all the stuff you're doing, maybe you don't need Oracle Machine Learning, you just need R. But the hope is you're going to use R and also in the coming weeks, Python languages to do whatever you want to do, but using the in-database techniques and then have the open doors to do whatever else you need to get done using the open source community packages as well. So this is a real brief little demo of, of how the R uh, works. And so first of all, I'm, load, I'm sort of setting this up. I'm doing my connection. Notice at the bottom, I'm loading up all these little packages. These packages like OREDM, ORE stats, ORE eval, these are all the handshaking. These are all the packages that do the handshake between the world of R and the world of the statistical, of the world of the in-database functions. Now, once that's done, I can review the data. I can start doing graphs and such, but that histogram is computed in database, right? All the calculations, the min, the max, and, and, and the bin boundaries, and dividing that up and doing the counts to render that histogram is all done inside the database. Here I'm using ORE stats to calculate a box plot, but the math to render those box plots, the median and the, and the three sigma and the 25% quantiles is all done using the in database statistical functions. In the scatter plot matrix, uh, I'm just graphing data. In this one, I'm just graphing data. I'm not actually adding any value there because it's just simply a uh, visualization of R, but um, that kind of gives you an idea of how uh, you can leverage your native tongue of R, or for that matter, Python, leverage the in-database capabilities, access and see the data in the database, push everything down where there's an equivalent SQL function, and do callouts wherever you need to, to, to do something special or something custom or something funky. Continuing on, we also have these Oracle machine learning notebooks that come with the autonomous database. Now, what I just showed you are two user interfaces that are available for the on-premises world in the cloud Database is a cloud service, you can still use those as well, of course. In the autonomous database, where everything's a lot more packaged and locked down and just sort of simplified, we've been moving to a thinner client kind of user interface uh, paradigm. And there, notebooks have become very, very popular. So the Oracle machine learning notebooks are based on the Zeppelin open source technology, and they are a collaborative user interface for data scientists and analysts. They're packaged with the database, so you don't have to do anything. You open up the autonomous database transactional or data warehouse autonomous and you have access to all this functionality. There are nine, currently nine, we'll probably grow that, uh, example notebooks that are quick start notebooks for classification, anomaly detection, association rules, and whatever. And you can just take those notebooks in the example gallery, uh, read them, review them, export them, because you can't run them, they're just examples. Import them into your own workspace and run them on the demo data, and then change the demo, change the data, and map it to your own data and run them again. Okay, it's a very nice way to get started. They are currently speaking SQL, PL SQL, Markdown language, and the Python integration is coming very, very soon. And you can schedule these notebooks to run as jobs. You can run the whole notebook as sort of a flow, if you will. And they're very, um, they're very handy because you can also, as you can see with the Markdown language, explain what you're doing, and I can work with teams of people. So I've done this 
with a number of people where I'm logging in, I'm doing my thing, somebody else is doing it. They say, well, now take a look at it. I've just done this. It refreshes, and we're all working as a, as a team of data scientists. It's very sort of productive in that way. And when the Python integration comes along, it's the exact same thing, right? Except some of the paragraphs will be Python. So I can la launch any kind of a, a mat, a plot, lib um, graphic in here. I can uh, run the Python language to call the same machine learning functions. It's very... Um, you know, you're just using Python in that same notebook. So it's a very nice way for people of multiple languages to use the same notebook um, to collaborate together and get more done. And the way the Python works that's coming very soon in the next coming weeks, as I'll keep on repeating, uh, is exactly the way we do the R integration. Okay, there's multiple uh, uh, components on how we do that, but the main one is the transparency layer. I leverage proxy objects so that the data remains in the database, and I overload native functions, translating function, uh, R functionality into the equivalent SQL functionality. So I can use familiar R and Python syntax to manipulate the database data while the data is in the database. And the main power is being able to do that, but drive the in-database OML for SQL uh, algorithms but using the different language, OML for R, or OML for Python APIs to do that. Um, very, very powerful. Also, as I've said, if I need to do something special or funky and I want to use any kind of open source package, I can do what's called the embedded execution. I can manage and invoke R or Python scripts in the database, and it can use um, uh, data parallel, task parallel functionality for like maybe doing a partition by, getting the data set and ready to go, but then make a call out to some sort of function that's that's uh, not available in the database. And the last thing is something that's coming that's kind of new. Oracle Machine Learning for Python is coming, but part of that is this new AutoML, which does a lot of automation. So like some of the other different players, you, the specialty players you see out there these days that do sort of a shotgun approach of exhaustively running through all these different models, we're going to do the same sort of thing in an intelligent way with intelligent feature selection, model selection, and hyperparameter tuning. But we're going to do that using our algorithmic function, our, our algorithms inside the database. And so the way that this auto ML, auto ML works, there's two parts of it. There's the server side auto ML that you can use from the Python language, and that's going to do this. And then there's also the user interface I'll talk to in a minute. But the auto ML is going to do this automatic algorithm selection. So depending on the data and the cardinality of the data and the sparsity and, and the data that you have, it's going to kind of say, yep, these algorithms tend to work pretty well in those kind of situations. These ones don't even bother. They don't work so well. So it's going to find the better family of algorithms faster. It's also going to do an automatic feature selection to reduce the number of features by identifying the most predictive ones and using those ones. And that oftentimes helps with improving performance and accuracy. And then once that's done, it's going to do auto-tuning of the hyperparameters to, so you don't have to do this iterative process yourself. It's going to automatically tune this and change the different parameters and see whether the linear or a Gaussian or these settings or those settings work. So you don't have to do this exhaustive search yourself. It'll do it for you. So this really enables non-expert users to leverage uh, the power of machine learning. Now, we're also putting a user interface on that, and this will come as part of the um, Oracle Machine Learning Notebooks. This is now called, we may change the name of it, but currently it's called Oracle Machine Learning Auto ML User Interface. And so just like you, you know, come off those notebooks um, and, and with these, you know, home notebooks and templates and so on, now you see a new button there called Auto ML and Models. And that is going to allow you to launch a wizard's type of approach that allows you to have, you know, you don't have to write any code. You just say, here's my target field. I want to predict home values. Well, home values is a numerical value, probably. It's going to know to use a regression technique. And it's going to go run off and build a number of different models automatically using the methodology, the auto ML methodology that I explained. It's going to pick out the best model. And then it's going to allow you to run that model either in batch or scoring to score data. It's also going to allow you through our REST services to deploy that model so it can be called outside of the database as well using a REST uh, API services. So there's a model leaderboard, there's model monitoring, there's a lot of other things that are coming with these uh, Oracle machine learning uh, services. But the AutoML simplifies the model build, um, makes it easier for any you know mere mortal citizen data scientist to build and apply models. You can also use the AutoML user interface to generate the notebooks that run behind the scenes so that someone else can take that notebook that, you know, take that model that you've built, edit it in a notebook and continue on and customize and do whatever. So you sort of publish the notebooks that are associated with this and you can, you know, work as a collaborative team working on things.
In the 20C database, there's also a couple of new features that are major new algorithms that are coming. Uh, everyone has always been wanting us to put in the X support for the XG Boost algorithm. It's a highly popular and powerful algorithm. It's won many Kaggle competitions, been used to win them. Um, it does classification, regression, ranking, survival analysis. So that is coming in the next major release of the database, XG Boost. It'll be an in database implementation of XG Boost. And also this other M MS MSET SPRT, multivariate state estimation technique sequential probability ratio test. So what this is, is a technique that came out of um, an acquisition when we bought Sun, that came out of the labs part of Sun, and it's been a, a methodology or an algorithm that's been very uh, appreciated in certain industries like nuclear power plant monitoring, things like that. And it is very good for having a um, process where you want to monitor it and you want to make sure it's running uh, smoothly and you want to detect any kind of subtle anomalies but you don't want to have a whole lot of false positives on that. You don't want to have false alarms. So we've re-implemented this technique. We've sped it up in the database. Uh, it's based on the original the Oracle Labs algorithm, but it's it's an in-database impl implementation of it now. So it's a little bit different. It's a lot faster. And you now have this as a, yet another uh, algorithm. And again, you can build the model on the data, then deploy it through the uh, Oracle machine learning services. So it just keeps on you know coming more and more exciting things that you can do from the um, Oracle machine learning um, and Oracle database offerings. But now I sort of want to pivot and I want to talk about, so what? So what happens if I have all these algorithms? How does that move the needle? How does that change, you know, the planet? And well, one thing I think it does, if you're thinking like me, is, is it's, you say, well, why do I have all these applications that just simply look at my past employee status or my past, you know, medical record or my past, you know, insurance claim or, or checking account or whatever? I should be able to embed predictive models into all my applications. And that's what we have been doing at Oracle. And this is the very first one. I was very active in the in the design and, and development of this thing. Um, and I just thought it was a lot of fun and I think it does amazing things. And what you see on the top are the results. What you see on the bottom are how we do that. Now you don't need to see how we do that. You just need to kind of focus on the top, which is I'm a manager. I see Justin Rico, if you can read it really small down there, says that he is very, very likely to leave. And the top reason for that is the amount of, I think it's sicker vacation time he's taking. And you may say, well, Justin, you know, what's going on? You may find out that Justin has a sick mother and he's staying at home to take care of that person. And, you know, what you can do is you can use this methodology that's inside the database and you can do even what if analysis. What if I were to change the input parameters, cut Justin a little slack and say, well, listen, I'm going to forgive you a week's worth of vacation of sick time because you have a special circumstance, or I'm going to reduce the amount of travel you have to do. And well, based on the, the way that other level four Java developers have performed with those, have reacted with those kind of settings, you'll make a new prediction. So it allows you to work very proactively by, you know, having built, you know, pre-built machine learning methodologies that are embedded underneath your applications. Your applications are now smarter. Here's another one, one of the newer ones that's popped out, Oracle Adaptive Intelligence Applications for Manufacturing. I also worked a lot on this one with that team. I come from a manufacturing background and I find this really you know, exciting and where things need to go. So now if you're doing root cause analysis and you're doing predictive um, modeling of what you, you think the output of your manufacturing process line is gonna be based on you know, the data that's coming off the, 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 the operational steps, um, you can take a look at that data, figure out when you're in specification, when you're above specification, when you're below specification, what are the reasons why? So we do use both decision trees and association rules to show you the reasons why. So you get a much greater insight, sort of a preview of where where um, where the results are gonna likely be. Are they gonna meet specifications or not when they finally get down to test and so on and are out in the field? And what are the reasons why the quality is good or bad? So it's a very, you know, automated process. You don't have to sit as a data scientist and do all this work manually. That whole analytical methodology has been embedded and built for you. So now we're we're halfway through this talk, and I hope you're still with us, uh, sticking through this, because as I think this is where it gets even you know more exciting. And so here we're talking about the changing role of the DBA, and from a database developer to a data scientist in six weeks. And I always kind of pause right here to kind of explain. I don't mean that it only is for database administrators or only database developers. I think there are a lot of different ranges of people, data engineers and so on. But you, in my mind, I think you are what I would call an Oracle data professional. You know how to spell SQL, you know your data, you know your operations, whether or not you're in the shoe business, the financial industry or whatever you're in, you know 
how to work with data in that field. And I contend that I've seen way many more Oracle customers uh, who are of that you know, Oracle data professional skill set add, incrementally add machine learning to their uh, skill set and become uh, an Oracle data scientist. I've seen much more of that directional growth than seeing, Oracle, seeing data scientists who are you know, locked in on open source Python or TensorFlow or R, and they don't really know the database. They don't really like even working anywhere close to a database. They want to work in their own world of Python or R. I've seen those, I've seen fewer of those people kind of make the migration towards knowing how to take advantage of our capabilities in the database than I have seen people who are Oracle people have gone the other way and simply added machine learning skills. And I want to talk you through that because I think there's this journey you go through. I contend you can do this in six weeks. It's kind of like learning how to ski in six weeks. That's how I actually learned how to ski in six Saturdays in a row, okay? I'm trying to learn how to play the guitar. It's, it's like, you know, if you if you do the do the homework and study it, each week you get a little bit better. And so what I've there, there's an Oracle University course that we're putting out. There's a series of blogs there's that, that you can use and read. There are many hands-on labs that you can use. So if you just sort of, you know, right now it's self-study, but we're putting more, you know, structure around this with an actual course you can take as well. But um, there are plenty of hands-on labs and self-study materials that I point to that you can use. And so the first point to recognize, I think, is that you are likely already doing much of the work, okay? There are these steps that you do, data extraction, data wrangling, deriving new variables. They say this is typically 80% of the work, and there are a number of different studies that support that. One of them is listed at the bottom. And my contention is you're probably doing much of that work already, and that is 80% of the work, and I'll talk in more detail about this. Then there's this part in the middle uh, that where the data mining, uh, machine learning magic happens. And kind of like Penn and Teller, who sometimes explain how certain magic tricks work, I want to show share with you how the machine learning magic works and the parts that may seem a little confusing. Like, how did they do that? I want to explain how we do that. And then once you have the model built, typically you would have to import the predictions and insights. You'd have to translate and deploy the machine learning models and then automate this whole process. And that's where most pro machine learning data science projects fail because translating and deploying the models is a bear. It's a mess. And so that's completely eliminated or minimized with Oracle because we've taught the data management platform that undergirds all the rest of your enterprise operations. We've taught uh, that data management platform how to do math. So that really changes everything. So in doing this, I like to fall back on this uh, popular CRISP DM methodology. It's very simple, very, very simple, very old, but because of its simplicity, it's held up over all these years, and it's the cross-industry uh, standard for data mining processing. I think it's something like that, and I was actually involved with it a long time ago, but I always have a hard time remembering the name. Um, and it really says there are these six different steps. There's business understanding. You need to know your business. You need to know what you're, what it is that you're trying to do. Are you trying to predict churners? Are you trying to predict employees that voluntarily leave? Who's going to default on a loan? You have to be very precise and crisp about that, and I'll talk about that more. Then you have to know your data. What data do you have? What data should you get? Okay, you can't just accept, I have this data, I got to press go. You, you need to think about what data you should acquire or derive variables and so on. So there's data preparation. There's the two new steps, and you're probably doing a lot of that already. There's the two new steps, the modeling and the evaluation that I'll go through. Because of so much of machine learning is automated these days, I contend that's the easiest part for you to learn. Because there's so much automation that happens there. And the deployment is something you're probably already doing today with scripts and, and putting out dashboards and reports and using applica Oracle Application Express and so on. So there's a lot of different steps. And if you look at these, each of these different steps has a lot of subcomponents. And now there, there are many things. So if you start on the far left, you, uh, business understanding, you need to have a well-defined business problem. You can't just say, I'm looking for people, who, employees that leave voluntarily a trite, because what do you do? Do you have a variable stored, like these people voluntarily left? What if they left on maternity or paternity leave? What if they unfortunately died? What if they retired? Are they all categorized in the same way? You don't want to build a model that predicts that. You want to predict a model that predicts, you know, which people are likely to not, you know, or are likely to leave voluntarily. Moreover, you want to know, as an early warning system, you want to know not what they look like on the day that they walked out the door. You want to know what they look like three months before they walked out the door or gave their notice. So you want to take a look at a snapshot of what the person looked like three months beforehand. So you need to think about that business problem. If you're trying to find better, good customers, well, what's your definition of that? So there's a lot, each of these steps has a lot 
that goes into a data understanding. You need to assemble the right data. If I'm trying to predict employee attrition, maybe I need to know, well, what's the standard salary for a level four product manager in Boston versus what I'm paying this person as a level four? I mean, what are the Boston rates versus the San Francisco versus the Mississippi rates and so on? So you want to assemble the right data. You want to think about that. You want to do data profiling. Under data preparation, depending on the data and the, and the, and the mixture of the data, you'll probably want to do sampling and stratified sampling, more importantly. You have all these domain-specific transformations, kind of the, some of the examples I talked about, like what's your bonus amount, but what's your bonus amount compared to your peers? That's probably a more interesting variable. We call that developing you know, engineered features, and that's where your domain expertise comes into play. Still, nothing to do with modeling. We haven't built a model yet. We finally get down to modeling. Uh, we do stratified sampling, feature selection. We build different models. A lot of that and more and more of that is automated, as is on the left-hand side, the evaluation. And that can be sort of an endless uh, process there, depending on how much you want to get into that. But it's easy to just pick. Each of these models does a pretty good job. I'll take this one. It does a you know good enough job, and I can understand what it's doing. And then I have a deployment where I just want to run that methodology. So each of these things are very important. The good news is, the ones in red are automated or has reasonable system defaults with Oracle machine learning. So if you look at what's left in the black, well-defined business problem, assemble the right data, domain-specific transformations for developing you know, engineered features, uh, model selection, model evaluation, and then deployment, those are things that you're probably you know, able to do and pick up uh, the rest uh, pretty easily. So that's why I contend it's not such a far reach for you to add machine learning to your otherwise vast set of Oracle data skills. So this journey uh, has six major steps based on this. And as I said, it's a little conceptual right now. There is a course that's coming out with Oracle University. We're working with them right now. There is a series of blogs. If you go to Oracle Machine Learning, you'll see a series of blogs, week one, week two, week three, uh, that, that, that it keeps on uh, you know being added to. And then there's these hands-on labs. And I'll show you those at the end. There's a number of hands-on labs you can do. So let's get into each of the different major steps. I'm gonna cover it briefly. Um, the nice thing is that the user interfaces that we have, in this case, we have the Oracle Machine Learning SQL Developer Extension, Oracle Data Miner. These actually have a bunch of support for these different steps. So if you're doing business understanding, you have to define what's your you know, business problem. That's basically just a, a business statement and name your workflow, you know, trying to find, you know, targeting good customers or something. You have data understanding, there's an explore node. You have a data preparation, there are transform nodes and SQL query nodes. Modeling, you have a model build node in the center here for evaluating. You have um, model, uh, uh, that's actually the, the evaluations in the model build node as well. For deployment, you can export the model uh, details. You can make predictions and leave the tables um, as tables or views inside the database. So there's a lot of um, automation and sort of bumper pads around the code that you would under you can use the code if you want to but why use code if i can use a gui and just generate you know the flow this, this will also generate the code but my point is the major steps of this crisp dm are all supported via the gui and if you're using the new notebooks the oracle machine learning notebooks up on the autonomous databases uh, data warehouse and transactional databases you get all of these uh, example notebooks and the example notebooks are available for you to just open them up anomaly detection association rules classification and open it up see what it does export it import it into your own space change run it make sure you know what it's doing on the demo data and the repurpose it to run it on your data and you are now you know empowered to become a oracle data scientist and there's a lot of explanation of what it's doing and if you can read a little bit of sql um, it, you should be off to the races rather rather quickly so we're going to go through the next six weeks and the next 10 minutes maybe here, and then we'll wrap up. So week one, business understanding. Here you need to start with a well-defined business state problem statement. And these seem good. Predict employees that voluntarily churn. Predict customers that are likely to churn. Target my best customers and so on. How can I combat fraud? Please do not ever get involved with the last one. I've got all this data. You know, Charlie, you data scientist guy, can you mine it for me and find all these useful insights? No, don't go there. That's just a... It's fraught with problems. If you do it, you, you, you'll have a lesson learned. You'll say, why did I ever do that? I didn't have a good business uh, understanding, good problem statement. I can't just go whacking through data trying to find things. That is that is not the way to go about this. So whereas these things seem like they're good, I want you to think about what our good friend Albert Einstein said when he said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes of that hour thinking about the problem statement 
and five minutes thinking about the solutions. So, for example, if he's asked to save the planet, does that mean save all the men, women, and children, or just the women and children, or just the men? Does he mean to does if we're asked to save the planet, does it mean to save the fishes and the animals and the trees? How long do you want to save the planet for? Do you want to save it for forever? Maybe just put it put everybody in formaldehyde, right? Or do you just want to save it for five minutes while an asteroid goes by? So maybe you beam everybody up into space for five minutes, let the asteroid go by, beam them back down to the planet, things like that. So I think he's very uh, insightful, very smart man in saying, think about the problem statement for a long time. And I contend 40% of your machine learning conceptual energy, brain energy should be applied, 40% should be applied just on making sure you have a very crisp, well-defined problem statement. And I encourage you not to get caught in the sand trap of poorly formed problem statements. You know, how can I make more money? I've got all this data, can you mine it? How can I combat fraud? You know, who are my best customers? All these things, they sound great, but you're just gonna get caught into, you know, um, a sand trap here. You're gonna waste a lot of time and I'll, and I'll kind of discuss that. So predicting employees that leave. Well, that sounds okay, but like I said before, are you trying to, do you have a field in the database that says these people left and these people didn't? You probably say active employee, not active employee, and you don't remove those ones who um, were fired, those ones who were um, retired, went on maternity leave. And so what you wanna do is you wanna think about who are the people that voluntarily left, and I wanna flag them with a one or a yes or something. Everybody else that that, that I wanna use as counter examples for the algorithm to, sort through all this, they would be flagged as zeros or no's. And then that sort of, as you think through this problem and get precise and crisp in it, it sort of logically maps it into a standard machine learning function. In that case, classification, because it's a binary outcome. Yes, no, zero, one. Similarly, for customers that churn, um, same sort of thing. And I contend, like, if, if I'm a cell phone carrier, cell phone customer, and I have a, a droid here, and I'm on, uh, you know, a certain a carrier, if I put that droid away and put it in the drawer and switch over to another device, another carrier, but I just pay my monthly bill for the next six months as I just kind of run that plan out, is that churn? And I might want to think about that because if my usage of that product has dropped significantly and it's less than 20% of what the, it previously was, I've effectively churned. I've effectively churned from that company. They just did. They just don't know it yet. So I have to think about what's my definition of people who have churned, yes or no. Um, in targeting best customers, what's your definition of best? Is it just people who bought a car or people who paid more for the car with all the expensive options than the population average did? Or maybe I want to use recency frequency monetary logic to figure out who are my best stratified customers based on those three dimensions. Or who has spent more than $500 in the most recent 18 months? So, you know, just like in medicine, you need to say, well, who's going to, you know, have a nosocomial infection in a hospital and have you know, pneumonia? There's a very precise definition, diagnosis for when you call it pneumonia and when you don't. And in the same way, you need to be very precise about what it is you're labeling your data as this is what I'm looking for and these are this is what I'm not looking for. Uh, and so this goes on. As you, as you walk through these examples, they sort of naturally map into different um, uh, uh, natural uh, uh, techniques, um, whether that's association rules for uh, who's going to, you know, what items go with what baskets, um, how much is each customer likely to spend? That's a regression because you're predicting a numerical value. How can I po combat fraud? That's anomaly detection, I suppose, unless it turns out you have a lot of examples of fraud. I know a guy that was doing check fraud at a bank. I asked him, well, you're using the anomaly detection algorithm, right? He said, no, I've got yeah, I've got lots and lots and lots of examples of check fraud. I'm using one of your standard classifying techniques for check fraud. Something else I might use in anomaly detection because I only have one or two percent, you know, observations of that. But think about the problem, be very, very surprised, and it will help map you into a standard machine learning function. And when you use the Oracle machine learning, we provide support for doing that. Here is the Oracle uh, machine learning notebooks where we're targeting our quote best customers who have good credit. You know, I could have just gotten a FICO score, but they also complete all of their payments. So they buy a flat screen TV or a, a large uh, appliance and they, they make all their payments. So what in this scenario, if you read the, the details, some people are buying these items. They seem to have good enough credit. They, they, they're going to prove, but then they lose their job or they can't make their payments. So they choose not to make their payments. We're trying to avoid selling to those kind of customers. We want to sell them maybe something different. So in the business problem statement, you want to be very precise about what you're looking for. 
and you want to see, aha, these are good credit customers that make all their payments. They they represent less than 20% of the population. So you want to visualize this data, you want to understand it, and you have to be very precise about what you're trying to do. And if you're using, well, now we're, we're ready to go on to, to week two. So week two, data understanding, review the available data. Does it make sense? Now you may need to go back and get additional data because you don't have the right data. And that's sort of a loop that you go through sometimes. But let's look look at the data that we've assembled so far. Are all the ages all positive between, I don't know, zero and, I don't know, as high as 120? Uh, they seem to be. Are all the income values, are they weekly, monthly? What is that income value? It's not, it doesn't have a dollar sign on it. What is? What does that really mean? Are the loan amounts reasonable? Do I have the right data? Does and, and this is something you need to go through by first looking at the data. You then want to typically look at the data in graphical form. You want to do univariate graphs to see like a histogram or a bar chart of every variable. You want to also op, op, uh, oftentimes look at that bar chart or pie chart, bar chart or histogram or scatter plot grouped by a grouping variable, which is usually the target field. It's the best way to do it in machine learning. So here I have people that have good credit and people that I'm calling other credit. I'm trying to see, okay, for uh, show customers by the max credit card amount spent. So it looks like the good credit customers actually seem to have spent, have a lot of max credit cards, but down here it's a little bit less, uh, a lot of not so good credit customers down here. So you, you want to visualize the data in Oracle Data Miner the extension to SQL Developer, the thick client for doing all this. You're looking at the same thing, and we'll render histograms and do a group by the, tar you know, the target field, yes or no, are they buying insurance or have good credit? You're trying to see if there's some sort of pattern here. So week two, I want you to really think about all the different ways you'd look at your data, understand it. Don't worry about modeling. Just focus on, does the data make sense? Do you have the right data? Um, think about that. Week three, we're up to data preparation. So this is where I think you may realize how much of the work you're you're actually doing because they say 80% is in these first few steps. So if I'm a data scientist and I and I want to get a problem solved, I want to go to my uh, data base guy, my guy that has the keys to the data, and I want to say, hey, I'm trying to build a model and I need age because I want to know who's going to likely buy a Tesla car. And I have this theory that the younger they are, the more likely they are to buy a Tesla car. So do you have age? And I'll probably be told, well, I, I don't have age per se, but I have date of birth. I can compute that for you if you want. And if I'm a smart data scientist, I'd say, hey, thank you. That's great. Just give me the, the age. I don't want to have to compute that in Python or R or whatever. Next variable I have is the address. Well, oftentimes I might not care about the address, but if I think about it, I might say, you know, what would really be cool is if I knew the distance from my house to the Tesla dealership or what's my commute time to that job. And I could again, go through this negotiation with the keeper of the data, say, do you have that data or could you compute that? Well, with Oracle Spatial, I can compute things like that. So I might have that be another derived variable. Now in uh, telephone, uh, in, call, in uh, communications, you have these call detail records, CDRs. And oftentimes if I call you and then you call me back and then I call you back and we do these calls right together, that might indicate a dropped call. And as a data scientist, I would say, I would like to know how many dropped calls this customer is having and has the rate of drop calls increased recently compared to the longer term population, you know, longer term observations. So that you could do inside the database using something called a SQL patterns uh, function. Um, and I might want to do other things like the percent of international calls, a uh, salary percent versus peers. All these things are derived new attributes that we are in data science land call engineered features. And someone's got to do this work. And I contend that you're doing a lot of this data wrangling, a lot of data engineering already in support of the data scientist. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting is if the data scientist is doing all this work in say Python or R, and now I get to the point where I wanna productionize this, that Python or R code may not map so easily back to equivalent SQL functions. Now, if you're using the Oracle Machine Learning Python or R with the pushdown, you will hopefully have solved that problem. But you know, the more you're doing this, you know, um, complex methodologies and transforms outside the database. When it comes to productionizing this, you have to deal with all that. Also in week three, uh, I want to point out we have a lot of functionality. This is the Oracle Machine Learning uh, Explore node, the Oracle Data Miner uh, Explore node. It's part of SQL Developer. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at all the different missing values, outliers, too many distinct values, too many constants. We're going to flag any correlated data. So we're going to give you a little hints over here, like maybe these variables are not the best variables to carry forward because they have too many unique values or too many constants. We're going to calculate the importance to say these are the variables that have the strongest correlation with the target field buying insurance. And we're going to do a lot of sort of data profiling using our the Explore node here. Actually, this is the... Um, 
column filter node. Uh, I need to correct that. This is the column filter node. Also, the um, Oracle Machine Learning's under the hood has all this automatic data preparation, ADP. And so each of the algorithms will have their, their own embedded ADP that handles missing values, outliers, binning, and all this stuff. Um, but um, but we also, uh, so we do this for all the different algorithms. And if you want to manually override anything you do to change the binning, to change our treatment of outliers or missing values will replace with a mean and the mode. If you want to change that, you can do that. But if you just take the defaults, um, we're going to do all that for you automatically. So there's a lot of, I've seen people take, say, Python and manually take, normalize every input variable. So salary and age are all normalized between zero and one. And you have to do that on the way in the algorithm, on the way back out of the algorithm to have it interpretable by humans. We do all that stuff automatically for you. So um, there's a lot of well, data preparation that is required by the algorithms. The, the stuff I was showing you back here is what I would call engineered features required from the, your domain experience. This is the most powerful and important stuff, I think. This other part down here is what you need to do in order for the algorithms to run, and we've automated a lot of that for you. We're up to week four where we're actually building the models. Uh, and the model build is is the syntax I showed before. Begin, DBMS data mining, create model. We're doing the create model two right here where we just sort of explicitly uh, state uh, the settings of the algorithms. And I can do this in the notebooks, I can do it in SQL Developer, or I can use a GUI and just kind of click. And so here we find what are the key variables most associated with good credit and bad credit. And there are the top N uh, attributes for that. And and so so that's one thing you can do. You don't have to do an attribute importance, but I'll a lot of people, it's good practice just to kind of say, what are the, across the board, regardless of what algorithm, what are the attributes that seem to be really driving my methodology, driving my, um, my, my target value here? And this part I like to kind of show because like Penn and Teller, I think, you know, I want to reveal some of the magic of machine learning. I think when you say, and I've asked, you know, hey, do you know how we figure out what the accuracy of that model is? Uh, a person that's still sort of new to this will scratch their head and go, yeah, how do you know that? Well, it's easy. We have a holdout sample. We 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 take and predict the past using a sample of the data. Typically, we'll take uh, uh, out of the out of the data that's in the database that we that we analyze, and that could be all the data or a sample of the data. You know, might take a 10% sample of a 200 million record uh, table or something like that. And of that sample, we're going to take a 60% sample of that, okay, or of that total table because we we don't want to build the model on all the data. Sometimes you'd run the risk of doing something called overfitting or overtraining the model or almost memorizing the patterns in that larger set of data. So we have a holdout sample. And so on, say, the default in that Oracle build node, the, the, the data mining build node, the default is 60-40. So we'll build a model on six, or build models on 60% of the data. And then we'll have a holdout sample of the other 40% that we use to test the model. And now we'll test the model, we'll predict the past, if you will, and then we'll be able to evaluate the results of that model and see how accurate that 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 model is. Um, so that's the process of, of model building. And as I've said before, there are defaults for all of this. And in AutoML, we'll add even more defaults. But I contend if you just kind of go through that build node or go through the notebooks that we have or uh, that we'll provide, there's a lot of examples and templates for you to use to get going. And again, if you're using the drag and drop GUI, it's just this build node right here. You get your models, you can evaluate them and view them. You can build multiple models with different algorithms and settings. That's what the build is. And that happens very, very quickly inside the database because, as I've said a few times, we move the algorithms, not the data. So it's it's all happening inside your database. There's, there's no schlepping data back and forth. Week five is now where we do the evaluation. So we've had a, a randomly selected holdout sample of the data. We make predictions about the past, and we see how good of a lift or how good the accuracy is or root mean square error. There's a lot of different ways you can measure this. I always like to just look for a good, robust lift curve here, something the naive guess says, this vertical line here, if I'm looking for, if I have 10% of my population is going to buy insurance, well, after 40% of the population, I have found 40% of the pop, forty percent of the people that buy insurance. If I'm just simply randomly picking people out to say, I think you're going to likely buy insurance. Well, if only 10% buy it, I'm going to be wrong 90% of the time. And in, in order to find everyone, I have to actually touch and reach out and, and communicate with 100% of the population. If I use a predictive model, after only 20% of the population, I've got up to here 65% of the people I'm looking for I found. So I've sort of trained my, um, my, my model to look for certain things. And very efficiently, it's got a huge lift This because it looks like the lift on an airplane wing. 
Um, it's got uh, uh, the, the the cumulative gains and the lifts show show great uh, 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 you know advantage over the naive guess. So I, all of these look like very good models. So now that I have a good model, I can go to town with this, right? I can just go off and start making predictions. So select a customer where these are the settings, uh, or you know these I want to use that predictive model. Sort them based on the probability of a good credit score. Maybe I want to filter them down by age or income or whatever, but the key value that I've done is to add this prediction probability score. Now, we also add things like prediction details that are the reasons why. Um, that's that's another very powerful feature. Like, I think this prediction is this because his gender was male and his age was this and so on. But I'm doing the deployment inside the database. And if I want to run a script like this that's just looking to find uh, anomalous records and a set of insurance claims, uh, I can build this model um, straightforwardly on my laptop for about 15,000 records. This takes about a second. So I build the model and score the model all in like under a second. And if you think about this and how many new open doors that opens up for you as an Oracle data professional to add machine learning skills and become an Oracle data scientist, it just opens up these, these huge opportunities for things you can do to add value uh, to your data you know, and to your company. And congratulations, um, if you go through this whole process and you, you spend the time doing the homeworks and do the hands-on labs and read the blogs and eventually we'll have a course on this, but you know you are you you become an Oracle data scientist. Um, now be careful that doesn't have any kind of you know official value. It's it's a conceptual Oracle data scientist thing. When we have the course, you'll do that and you can get a certificate and we'll have, we're coming out with a certification program. But right now it's a self-study program. Watch this um, YouTube, watch, the, read the blogs, do the hands-on labs, and you will be coming an Oracle data scientist. But wait, there's more. And, and I love this. I stole this from somebody else. I just like that. Wait, there's more. And the more is, well, where are those results? They're in the database, right? And, and, and as a data scientist, I'm looking at them. I'm, I think those graphs and tables and charts are cool. But other people in the company probably want to use something like here we have Oracle Application Express and here I'm doing a, a demo that is about predicting a good value of a good bottle of wine. We have less than 90 points and greater than 90 point wine. So I'm trying to use a bunch of data about bottles of wine. I want to go into the bargain bin and I want to figure out where can I find, likely to find a good bottle of wine for say under $20 that's likely to be a 90 point or above bottle of wine. Now I did this, this demo with a few different people, uh, David Peak and Don McGann, the product managers for Oracle Application Express. I did this uh, with uh, Francesco Tussaud from Ritman Mead uh, on um, using Oracle Analytics Cloud. And it's just a nice, you know, simple demo that, that I had some fun doing some collaborations with some other very smart, capable people. And I want to give them credit for their work. Um, here's the work that with Francesco Tussaud, who's put together a very nice, very beautiful Oracle Analytics Cloud uh, graphic where we're looking for you know, here's the bottles of wines that are $20 or $30, and if I click on that and drill through, I can see that most of them are not that high of a probability of being a good bottle of wine. But, you know, if I want to spend $150, I can get a very likely good bottle of wine. But maybe I can come down here and find some real sleepers, find some real dark horses that are really good bottles of wine, and that's what we do. We go, or that's what he did uh, using Oracle Analytics Cloud. So now we have the, the top countries where the wine's coming from. Don't ask why England. There's another part of the story for that. Uh, what province they're coming from, what variety of wines, and then here's our little predictions. So I can sort through here and say, well, here's a bottle of wine that is $17, um, and it's 94% likely to be a good bottle of wine based on the inputs of price, variety, country, and so on. Now, in this data set, there's two versions of this demo. The second, more complicated one, actually uses the unstructured uh, review comments by the tasters. It says, oh, this is a caramel flavor, this is a blackberry scents, this is nutty, and this is thin, or this is weak. And based on those words, we also make even better predictions using the unstructured data. So this is the simpler version of it. You can also do the other more complicated version. Now, I did this work with Brendan Tierney, who's a most amazing author on several Oracle machine learning books. Uh, he runs a company, Oracle Analytics, or Oralytics over in Ireland, and he's, he does brilliant work. And he did this where now I can take and use the Application Express um, REST services, the, the REST services that come with Application Express, oh, I guess I cut out the rest of this, but in this demo, and you can see different versions, just Google for Oracle Machine Learning Wine, predicting wine, I think is where it, where it is. We'll use the REST services, we'll do a REST API, and we can actually hook this up to some sort of, you know, recommendation engine widget or whatever, but the models that we've built are callable um, by a, a number of different Oracle technologies. And what Brendan Tierney showed was how we use the REST API services to go off and do this. So so very powerful stuff. Um, I have the rest of that, I guess, in some other YouTubes and such. Send me a note if you're, if you're looking for that. 
And so in summary, thank you for listening to this whole thing. Um, you can get more information by just Googling Oracle Machine Learning. You'll find us out on oracle.com, uh, or you just go to oracle.com slash machine learning, and you get to our website with all the links to literature and tutorials and documentation and customer references and so on. Now, as a self-study, I also recommend that you use many of the different quick starts, hands-on labs, documentations. And if you see over the lower right, this is what we did at Oracle Open World. Uh, we had 50 or 60 people in the class. We did it four times at Oracle Open World, so we had a lot of people there. They all look, they all look happy. Uh, we did these notebooks, and if you click on these links, that, um, or if the best way to do this, just Google Oracle Machine Learning uh, Blog, Oracle Machine Learning Blog, and you'll get to all these tutorials that are out there. Um, but send me a note at charlie.berger at oracle.com if you can't find it. But there are a lot of resources out there sort of as a self-study way for you to do this. And if you just self-study, kind of like learning how to play the guitar and Googling and seeing different guys teach you how to do this and teach you how to do that, I contend you can, you know, very rapidly add machine learning skills to your otherwise vast set of Oracle data skills and become an Oracle data scientist. So with that, thank you very, very much. I really do appreciate your time and attention. Listen to this. I wish you the best in applying yourself to um, to to learn these new skills. I do not think they, they are so much of a leap uh, for you to do this. I, I really say if you're analytically curious, and I joke, if you know the difference between a mean and a median, and, and you say, yeah, of course I know that, and you know your data and you have Oracle technology around, you too are very likely to be you know, an Oracle data scientist. It's very achievable, very attainable. So I wish you the best of luck in your journey, and thank you for listening to this uh, webinar.